recording. Okay, no, no problem. Got it. Okay. Okay, so everything is fine. So I will go with the sun. So good evening to the people in Japan and, uh, and in China. Good morning to the people in USA and good afternoon to the people in Europe. Thank you very much for coming in it's such a great number. I know that the speaker is a delicacy to hear. So uh, we will be ready to um, here at Le Flosse in one second. This is the first seminar or of the spring uh, IJMF Spotlight Seminar Series, uh, which uh, is starting uh, today. And uh, we will have repeating uh, occasions every two weeks. Now, the speaker of today is uh, Detle Flose, and uh, I probably don't wouldn't need to introduce him, but I just uh, take pleasure to introduce him to just uh, have the chance to discuss briefly uh, all the things that he a few of the things he accomplished after getting his PhD in Marburg in '92 in physics. Then he was postdoc in Chicago and eventually got the chair of fluid uh, in fluid mechanics in uh, in Twente. And he was in Twente since uh, 98, uh, where he founded the Physics of Fluids group. His uh, interests are in turbulence, multiphase flows. And uh, the interesting thing is that his range of interest uh, goes from the very micro scale to the very, very large scales. So he was able to cover a huge range of parameters in, uh, in this field. Uh, among, this, uh, among his uh, acknowledgments, uh, among uh, there is the EPS Fellowship, the Euromac Fellowship. Uh, he's a member of the American Academy of Engineering. Uh, he's a member of the Deutsche Academy of Sciences and among uh, uh, his prizes, uh, there is the Spinoza Prize, the Bachelor Prize, the Balsen Prize, the Max Planck Medal. And uh, of course, uh, we know him also because he's uh, associate editor of Journal of Fluid Mechanics since uh, many, many years. And uh, today, he will talk about dispersed multiphase Taylor quake turbulence from bubbly drag reduction to catastrophic phase inversion. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing this seminar. And now I just uh, leave the word and the, and the screen to you, Detlef, please. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Alfredo and colleagues, for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to give the first talk in this series. Um, and uh, I wondered whether in this series I should uh, speak on drops or on bubbles, uh, and uh, I in fact decided to speak on both. Uh, so you, you see my screen now, I guess. Yes, that left. Uh, good. So you see everything, right? Everything. Yes. Uh, good. So um, it's on dispersed multiphase. Taylor Kerch turbulence from bubbly drag reduction to catastrophic phase inversion. Um, so uh, this is joint work with various co-workers uh, whom you see here. And I will mention uh, what concretely they did when I come uh, to um, the respective work. So I already would like to mention Xiao Sun, who is in the audience and also uh, associated editor of International Journal of Multiphase Flow and uh, Roberto Vazico for the numerical part, and Sander Heusmann uh, and Dennis van Gils, who in fact built our Taylor Coet device. Uh, so the first question to be addressed is on bubbly drag reduction. And bubbly drag reduction is of tremendous importance in the maritime hydrodynamics. Um, so here you see a boat with a hull where bubbles are injected and the drag can be reduced considerably. Uh, bubbles also play a role here uh, for cavitation at the ship propeller. They also play a role for pile driving for wind farms uh, to shield the noise. And we have a wonderful program together with Marine, the Dutch ship testing facility, to address all of these questions. Um, so the motivation for the drag reduction is that this is of huge economic relevance. So 90% um, of all transportation is naval transportation. Uh, and uh, they consume a huge uh, amount of energy. Um, so the environmental issue is that uh, naval transportation eats up 900 million tons of CO2, uh, well, of energy leading to CO2. 
and you of course want to do something about this and already some reduction uh, would help so bubbly drag reduction seems to work but the question is why how to optimize it uh, and how to transfer lab experiments to real applications in the ocean uh, so the energy savings by bubbly drag reduction uh, for ocean ships, 15% have to have reported, for river ships, 20% even. And for our tail Cat facility, as you will see, we achieve 40%. But the key problem is a lack of the fundamental understanding what exactly is going on. And as you will see, it's a very, very complex problem. So here I show you some uh, performance and reproducibility. So different uh, boats uh, show different uh, drag reductions over the years. Uh, so it's not particularly reproducible, and you really see that we need some controlled experiments, not on the ocean, but in the lab. Um, and that brought us to our Drosophila of physics of fluids, the taylor Cat system. We would like to explore the drag in this system. It's two coaxial cylinders with liquid in between. They are co- or counter-rotating. And the great advantage is that you can not only make local measurements to see how the bubbles distribute, but you can also easily measure the overall uh, drag or torque. Uh, so the control parameters of the system are the uh, ratio between the inner radius and the outer radius and the aspect ratio. So basically the height of the container as compared to the gap width. And then the driving parameter uh, is the uh, Reynolds number of the inner cylinder and the Reynolds number of the outer cylinder. And in most experiments I will report, uh, I will keep the outer Reynolds number at zero. Um, so the great advantage of the system is that it is closed. You have global balances and it is mathematically well defined. So um, by um, doing uh, using this facility, you can um, achieve a flow which is statistically steady you can measure the torque and you can also well control the gas fraction here as you will see so you must think of taylor coet flow as a kind of wrapped up pipe or wrapped up channel um, so the advantages of taylor coet as compared to a channel or a pipe is that it, it takes less space so in us they have these huge pipe facilities well the netherlands is small so we have to be smart and we wrap up the pipe so to say um, and overall, you need less total power, uh, you have no sp spatial transients, and it's a closed system, and you have an extra control parameter. So the inner Reynolds number, the outer Reynolds number, and this ratio between inner and outer uh, uh, cylinder radius. So with this, these parameters, you can probe the physics of the system. We did early experiments together with Dan Lathrop back in 2005, and this is what you see here. So this is the drag as function of alpha, and alpha is the volume concentration of the injected gas for a certain Reynolds number, um, divided by the drag reduction uh, without gas. And what you see are two regimes, a regime of weak drag reduction up to a certain Reynolds number, and then from a certain Reynolds number on, the drag reduction, provided there is enough gas, so here for 5%, uh, goes down uh, dramatically. So the transition is once the Weber number is one. So here the bubbles are deformable, whereas here they are not deformable. Um, and this seems to play a role as these early experiments suggest. Um, so uh, what happens for higher Reynolds numbers and how do these bubbles locally distribute? Uh, but well, before we come to these questions, uh, to confirm that the drag reduction has to do with deformation, uh, we also looked into the comparison between uh, bubbly drag reduction and a possible drag reduction with particles. So we would put in light particles of similar size as the bubbles, also at 5%, and this is this red curve here, and you don't see any drag reduction there. So drag reduction with buoyant particles doesn't play a role. So again, a hint that bubble deformability uh, plays a role. So. Um, Let's also compare the drag reduction in a system with smooth walls, which you see here. So here is the torque, so the overall force to keep the inner cylinder rotating at a certain velocity, angular velocity. And then here we increase 
the uh, fraction of bubbles. So up here we have 0%, down here we have 8%, and you see we reduce the drag by about 40% uh, for this um, uh, 8%. Uh, and uh, we now do the very same experiment with rough walls, uh, and uh, we don't see any drag reduction. So from that, we see that drag reduction is a boundary layer effect. So the key uh, physics happens very close to the boundary layer. But there are many more questions to be addressed. Is um, the parameter space is large, so uh, let's better explore it. In particular, let's go for larger Reynolds numbers. And then let's do local measurements. How do bubbles modify the flow? How do they distribute inside the gap? And let's directly measure uh, the local Weber number. And of course, let's improve the precision of these experiments. You saw how large the error bar was. Um, and with all this, we hope to better reveal the physical mechanism of the drag reduction. And for that, and for other things, we bought, uh, we, uh, we built this uh, 20 turbulent Taylor Quiet system. It's a huge effort. Um, and well, Dennis van Dils uh, and Xiao Gerbe uh, Buchert, our technicians, they did a great job to build this facility. And many of you uh, have seen um, this um, uh, facility already. So um, the phase space of our Taylor Kiet machine is shown here. The inner cylinder goes up to 20 hertz and the outer cylinder up to 10 hertz. With this, we um, achieve Reynolds numbers of several times 10 to the 6. Uh, the gap width is variable. Altogether, we have 111 liter. And uh, cooling is the issue. So if we don't cool, uh, we would heat up the system by one Kelvin per minute. Um, so we cool for 20 kilowatts. So this 20 kilowatts, we have to pay twice. First for driving uh, the system, 20 kilowatts, and then for cooling. So um, here you see the device, and also the main players building this beautiful device. And in fact, here's a device with some bubbles already in it. Um, so the overall behavior uh, of this device is shown here. Um, I show you the angular velocity transfer, which uh, in dimensionless numbers is called Nusselt omega as a function of the Taylor number. And the Taylor number basically is the inner Reynolds number squared. And uh, let's focus on the case where the outer cylinder is not rotating. Uh, so uh, when you increase the Taylor number, you first get uh, these laminar Taylor rolls, uh, which are well known. Uh, and then you see a transition to turbulence. And then finally, uh, for Taylor, uh, larger than a few times 10 to the 8, you get this so-called ultimate regime where Nusselt goes like Taylor to the 0 0.39. I won't go into this. This is well understood. Um, and uh, it's summarized in our annual review of fluid mechanics, which we wrote a few years back. Uh, so here you see the data again compensated with Taylor to the one third. And it will, it will be mainly this regime where the experimental work will take place. So you can fit this regime with the effective scaling exponent uh, of uh, 0.39. Uh, so this is the ultimate regime. So uh, here again is our annual of review of fluid mechanics where we discuss high Reynolds number Taylor Piet turbulence, but uh, mainly without bubbles. So now we inject the bubbles uh, and um, we can do so for up to the highest Reynolds numbers. We have eight air injectors at the bottom. And with this, we can have a global gas concentration of up to 4%. And well, how to measure this? Which in fact is pretty easy. You inject the bubbles down here and the bubbles push away the liquid. And the liquid go into some overflow channels where you simply weigh the amount of water. So it's a very easy way uh, to measure the gas concentration to very high precision. And these are the results. So this is a torque with a certain gas concentration alpha, where this is a torque without gas concentration as a function of alpha going up to 4%. And you see that for small Reynolds numbers, 500,000, you have weak drag reduction. Um, it's reproducible. So you are two series of, uh, of runs. It's absolutely reproducible. Uh, and when you go to higher Reynolds number, in fact, you get uh, up to 40% drag reduction here. So here, uh, Reynolds 2 times 10 to the 6 with a drag reduction up to 40%. So it's really considerable. So only with 4%. What's going on? Um, well, I will now plot 
the drag reduction um, as a function of uh, alpha for these two Reynolds numbers. Uh, so drag reduction as function of Reynolds number for these two alphas, and you see uh, is going up to 40%. And for those two cases, Reynolds number of 500,000 and Reynolds number of um, 10 to the 6, uh, I will compare the data. So here you have weak drag reduction, and here you have strong drag reduction, here only 6% and here 18%. And we would like to, to, to look into the local flow quantities for these two cases. Um, so how do bubbles modify the local liquid velocity in the two uh, drag uh, reduction regimes? Uh, and uh, here I show you the velocity profile um, as a function of the uh, radial distance. So here's inner cylinder, here's outer cylinder, and two Reynolds numbers are shown here. Uh, this is the typical turbulent profile, uh, which you also understand why it looks like this, uh, with, without bubbles. And now we inject bubbles, uh, at first a little bit and then uh, more, uh, well, a little bit in Reynolds number and then more in Reynolds number 10 to the 6. And what we see is that the velocity in the center uh, goes down. Uh, and uh, it's also understandable uh, because the bubbles accumulate at the inner cylinder. And therefore, you have a weaker coupling of the bulk of the liquid towards the inner cylinder. Um, and uh, therefore, in fact, uh, the velocity uh, goes down. It's closer to what you have at the outer cylinder. So uh, how do the bubbles distribute in the flow in these two drag reduction regimes? Uh, we can measure this with optical fiber technology. And we got an optical probe uh, where basically this technique had been developed by Rob Mudde. Um, it's a fiber. You send in light, and the light gets reflected. And uh, how it's reflected depends on whether there is a bubble, yes or no. And then you get signals of this type. Uh, and with these signals, you can deduce what the uh, bubble concentration is. And this is what we see. This is for a small Reynolds number. Um, we see uh, the um, uh, in fact, considerable gas accumulation at the inner cylinder um, for weak drag reduction, so up to 30% locally. It's huge. Um, when we go higher in Reynolds number, where we have stronger drag, drag reduction, the uh, gas concentration, in fact, goes down. So clearly, it shows that it is not the amount of gas accumulation at the inner cylinder which uh, is responsible for the reduction in the drag. So uh, strong drag reduction is not solely dependent uh, on the local alpha here. So this is just the opposite as one may naively expect. But of course, it's understandable because here is much more turbulent. And therefore, the bubbles are pushed more towards the center uh, of the flow. So what then is the dominant mechanism behind the strong drag reduction? Um, and uh, there we come to the local Weber number. So here for a weak Reynolds number, um, 500,000, we see it's a local Weber number is in fact pretty small, whereas for strong drag reduction, the local Weber number is much higher. So clearly it is connected with the local Weber number and with bubble deformability. So here close to the cylinder, we have uh, in fact, a Weber number of eight, suggesting that the bubbles are strongly deformed close to the inner cylinder. So that is the responsibility. Um, uh, this is responsible for the drag reduction. So the conclusion from these large rally number experiments is that larger local gas concentration does not mean larger drag uh, uh, reduction. What's crucial is, is the local Weber number uh, and it's, uh, it's very large, leading to large deformability. And then these bubbles accumulate at the uh, interface between the boundary layer and the bulk, blocking momentum transfer and leading to drag reduction. So we would like to further confirm this. There are many, many um, dependent parameters in the system. So the Weber number I already mentioned, but there's also the Reynolds number I also mentioned, but there's also the fraud number. So the fraud number is defined here. So um, in fact, it, it, it's uh, one over a square root of gravity. Um, so large uh, fraud number uh, means um, small gravity effect and vice versa. It, it compares the centrifugal forces with the buoyancy forces. Uh, and um, the trick now is 
that we would like to change only one parameter. In the numerics, we can do this, and I will do this later, but also in experiments, we do this. So we only want to change the Weber number, and we can do so by adding uh, surfactants. Um, and um, so we basically change the Weber number by adding the surfactants and all other parameters of the system. So Reynolds, Froud, and the Gatz concentration alpha, they're all kept constant. Uh, and the idea is that by adding these surfactants, you get smaller and stiffer bubbles. You switch from free shear boundary conditions to no slip boundary conditions. And in particular, you suppress bubble coalescence. So uh, the turbulence is so strong that all these bubbles are smashed into pieces. Uh, and once you have surfactants, uh, the coalescence is suppressed. So overall, you get much smaller bubbles, and these bubbles behave like solid spheres. And the first who did this, in fact, is uh, Shu Takachi, who is also in the audience, and Professor Matsumoto. And the idea to do so, in fact, was triggered when Shao Sun and I visited uh, Tokyo. I think it was around 2009. And then uh, Shu put in his own water channel the surfactant. And it was so impressive uh, to see first uh, in clean water these very large bubbles, and then only a few drops of surfactants were added. The Triton X100, and then uh, the overall uh, uh, flow uh, features change dramatically. So locally, you really could see this. So same gas concentration, you add a little bit of Triton X, and there you go. Totally different features, much smaller bubbles. And this is uh, so nice about visiting labs. You get ideas. You remember uh, the experiments and uh, well so it's time for all of us to travel again to labs and to meet our colleagues not only via the screen but to go to the labs so this was really was an experiment triggered by really the visualization uh, Shu and colleagues did in Tokyo in their lab so um, we did so here too so we would rotate our inner cylinder at 20 hertz uh, and it's fully turbulent two times 10 to the six and then we would suddenly inject six parts per million of Triton X. It's only a few droplets. So we have 111 liters, we add a few droplets, and then throughout we measure the torque. And this is a dramatic result what we got. It's a drag reduction as function of time. So here for 4%, we have 40% drag reduction. And then at time zero, we now add the Triton X, and there you go, the drag reduction is gone. So it takes uh, a few seconds to mix, but then it's totally gone. I mean, a little bit is left, but this is simply the effect of the volume. So here, rather than 40% at uh, drag reduction at 4% uh, bubbles, you only get 4%. This is exactly what you expect, uh, simply the trivial effect by changing the viscosity, this is Einstein relation. So uh, the dynamical drag reduction really is deformability. And when you uh, turn this uh, off, uh, drag reduction is gone. So here I plot it differently. This is the drag coefficient. Uh, it uh, grossly increases once you add uh, these surfactants here. Uh, but you also see it in the flow structure. So on the left, it's clean water, where the Weber number is of these bubbles typically is 10. On the right, uh, it is after adding the surfactants, where the Weber number of the bubbles typically is 1. And we now zoom in on the left and on the right. And you really see the huge differences in the appearance of the bubbles. When we zoom in once more, you also see this here. So here you have large deformable bubble and here you have small non-deformable bubbles because coalescence is suppressed with the surfactants. So the summary of this surfactant study is that smaller bubbles suppress this coalescence. You get small stiff bubbles and they do not decrease the drag, whereas the large deformable bubbles do decrease the drag. And the Weber number effect is, is really very crucial to have strike reduction. But now let's go to numerical simulations here. Uh, and well, then for the time being, we are restricted to low Reynolds number cases. And I will first show you low Reynolds number experiments. Uh, and they are shown here by Murray. Uh, so um, those experiments have a Reynolds number of 10 to the 3. Um, and while well, they achieve 20% drag reduction with 1% bubbles. Note that this parameter regime of Murray mm -hmm. et al. Um, is very, very different from what we have. I mean, we have Reynolds number of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 
that very large bubbles, which are deformable 100 times the Kolmogorov radius, this is what I showed you uh, up to now, 40% rank reduction with 4%. And here, surprisingly, you have 20% rank reduction with 1% at these very low Reynolds numbers. But I will show you that this is a totally different mechanism. This has really nothing to do with each other. And I think part of the puzzlement in the drag reduction community um, originates from that these are very two different uh, effects. So how come? So I will first now uh, focus on these very small Reynolds numbers. So here you see uh, the size of the bubble as compared to the Komogorov scale. And I will uh, focus on experiments at numerics down here, very small Reynolds numbers. So what I showed you up to now is up here. Now I go down here. I mean, several orders of magnitude smaller in Reynolds number. Um, so here are the experiments by Murray et al. Torque reduction ratio uh, as function of Reynolds number. And what you see here is that, uh, in fact, with increasing Reynolds number, the effect of drag reduction goes down. Up to now, uh, in fact, the effect of drag reduction uh, would go up in this large Reynolds number regime. But this is only in the large Reynolds number regime. And here, for this very small Reynolds number regime, it is uh, just the opposite. And anyway, how to model this? Well, fortunately, because uh, you have... Uh, small Reynolds numbers, it's uh, not so difficult, and also these bubbles are small, so we can model them with um, point particles. So we have two very coupled Euler Lagrangian scheme with point bubbles, and they are coupled to the flow in the normal way by buoyancy, drag, added mass, and lift. Um, and this, in fact, is work done with uh, Katsu Sugiyama, whom we also met in Tokyo in the lab, and with Enrico Calzabrini, who is, I know, also in the audience today. And um, uh, with, uh, with them, we looked with this point particles into the drag reduction. And indeed, we could quantitatively reproduce these uh, drag reduction as a function of, of the Reynolds number. It also here, you see it's decreasing with increasing Reynolds number. And the reason is very simple and very different from what we had before. In the single phase flow, you have these Taylor rolls, the Taylor roll structure. Uh, but when you now, add bubbles, the bubbles rise, and they destroy the Taylor rolls, and therefore they destroy the angular momentum transfer from the inner cylinder to the outer cylinder. And it is this mechanism which uh, induces, induces the drag reduction. So here uh, I show you uh, the bubbles uh, interacting with these Taylor rolls. Uh, and now you can imagine that the buoyancy of these bubbles plays a major role. So here are other simulations. This is uh, other simulations we did. Um, they really very nicely reproduce the amount of drag reduction seen in the experiments. And the parameters we will now vary are both the Reynolds number from 2000 to 8000, and in addition, uh, the Froude number uh, to um, show the different uh, degree of buoyancy these bubbles have. Um, and with this, we can, in fact, study the many competing effects. I mean, as you know, for bubbly drag reduction, uh, there are various theories have been put forward, effective compressibility, and then, well, as you will see here, the important one, disruption of the coherent structure, deformability of the bubbles. This is for the large regime here. This is for the small regime. And by doing numerical simulations, uh, where the drag reduction depends on all these parameters, we can really focus on one to uh, turn off the dependencies uh, of the others. And what I will now focus is on Reynolds and on Fraud uh, and um, to see the influence of the two. And this is the, the result here. Um, drag reduction um, for the small Reynolds number regime. Um, and you see that for a large fraud number where buoyancy doesn't play a role, there's hardly any drag reduction. The bubbles are simply trapped in the vortices, whereas for small fraud number corresponding to strong buoyancy, there is strong drag reduction. This is exactly what we saw in this prior in numerics and what Murray et al. saw. So drag reduction goes down with increasing Reynolds number, but for the small Reynolds number, it's considerable, it's 4%. And, um, the reason is that once you inject these bubbles in this flow, um, all these structures, uh, these uh, plume structure and the Taylor rolls, they are washed out. So on the left, you see single phase flow. And on the very right, you see multi-phase flow with uh, bubbles with a large fraud number corresponding to small buoyancy effects. And this means the bubbles are basically trapped and they don't interfere with the flow. 
Whereas here, um, the bubbles interfere with the flow and they destroy these Taylor rolls and plumes, just as I showed you in these other plots. So uh, this is the mechanism of drag reduction. But once you now go to larger Reynolds numbers, um, then uh, the flow is so violent uh, that uh, this effect goes away. So the bubbles don't know do do have the buoyancy uh, at the potential energy to destroy these Taylor rolls. Uh, so uh, this is also seen here. Um, typical bubble trajectories, uh, when you have strong buoyancy effects here on the left, the bubbles rise. Um, whereas here on the right, where you have weak buoyancy effects, the bubbles are simply trapped in these vortices and they don't change much. But here you have drag reduction. Um, so where do the bubbles go? Um, well, here's a radial profile for these two fraud numbers and the axial profile. So in view of time, I focus on the axial profile. You see that for large fraud numbers, the bubbles are trapped in these Taylor vortices. So they're very local localized in the flow, right where the Taylor vortices are. Whereas for small fraud number effects right here, um, buoyancy is there and then the bubbles don't care so much about the Taylor rolls. And here you have the drag reduction. So here's the phase space again. Again, two very different regimes. Uh, for these small Reynolds number, you have classical turbulence or well, even not turbulence, sometimes you have Taylor rolls. You have subcomorgal of bubbles and buoyancy induced drag reduction. This is down here. Whereas here you have larger bubbles, they are deformable. Um, you are in the ultimate turbulent regime, um, and uh, you have this very strong drag reduction by bubble deformability. Of course, you would like to go in between to understand, to, to uh, bridge this gap from here to here. And you see these two numerical simulations, or this regime of numerical simulations, and this is what we did then later with Ramsey Spandan uh, and uh, how to do this. Well, we have to achieve larger Reynolds number. We have to achieve larger and deformable bubbles and more bubbles. And this is, of course, a huge effort in computational time. And uh, this effort, effort in our group over the years has been led by Roberto Vesico, whom you see here. Uh, and uh, he uh, developed this advanced final difference uh, solver going back, in fact, from his, uh, his time in the mid 90s when he was in Rome, but now he's back in Rome. Um, it's a second order final difference method. You have no turbulence modeling, it's really DNS. It's massively parallelized. You have 10 to the four cores. It's really petaflop computing. You have an extremely efficient Poisson solver. Uh, and in fact, you can also extend it to large uh, Prandtl and Schmidt number because uh, the, um, um, the Scala lives on a finer grid than the velocity. It's this Arvid, it's uh, open source and you can download it from the internet. So uh, the flows which we used, to which we applied Arvid are Rayleigh Benar, double diffusive convection and Taylor Quet. And I will focus on this here, of course. And here you see one of these simulations. Taylor is 10 to the 9. You see these Taylor rolls. Uh, you can see, you, you see how turbulent they are. Now you zoom in and you close to the cylinder. You really see the rolls and the boundary layers and, and these tricky structures uh, and dive into the flow. But to all this, we now have to add bubbles. And this is also challenging. Uh, and uh, well, um, Roberto is not only expert for uh, uh, advanced final difference, but also for the most boundary method, uh, which he co-developed, and uh, we coupled this uh, to this final different code. And with that, we could get deformable bubbles, which you see here, or deformable droplets. It's fully resolved bubble dynamics, and with momentum exchange, it's four-way coupled, uh, and you really get the deformation of the bubbles. And with these techniques, you get beautiful movies of this type uh, of Taylor Quiet flow with the bubbles passing by here um, and uh, causing, in fact, here's the vorticity, which you see. And uh, with this, we do get drag reduction. Of course, we can't go as high as in experiments. So we have an inner Reynolds number of 2 times 10 to the 4. But we do see. Uh, that now the bubble drag reduction goes up with Reynolds number and also with the Weber number, which you see here. And we get here even a drag reduction uh, of um, 8%. So this is really the regime uh, of uh, large Reynolds number and large Weber number where you get 
uh, deformability, drag reduction by bubble deformability. So these are these two regimes which we have. Uh, this regime which I showed here, the ultimate regime, large Reynolds number and large bubbles, you had drag reduction increases with increasing Reynolds number. It also increases with increasing Weber number. It's a Weber number effect and deformability is responsible. Whereas for the small Reynolds number uh, in the classical regime, you have tiny bubbles, but there uh, the drag reduction decreases with increasing Reynolds number. It increases uh, with uh, increasing buoyancy here. It's a fraud number effect. Uh, so it's buoyancy induced drag reduction. Very, very different. And, and uh, well, some people confuse it, but you see it's very different mechanisms. So from drag reduction with uh, gas bubbles, I would like to go to drag reduction with vapor bubbles. So we really would like to, uh, to uh, test this concept. And that we did with Rodrigo Ezeta to really see what about drag reduction with vapor bubbles. And for that, we did experiments with Novak 7000. It's an engineered liquid with a boiling point of 34 degrees, um, well, uh, high density, and with causality very, very small. So three times 10 to the minus seven. So the trick is that with this small viscosity, we can, in fact, in a smaller device, achieve the very same Reynolds number. Uh, and for that, we built this uh, boiling 20 telecreate device, which now only has roughly 10 liters of water, but it's excellent temperature control. We can heat it, we can cool it. Uh, we have a transparent outer cylinder to see what's going on. And these are the characteristics of the flow. Uh, and uh, well, the, this is the old facility here, which I mentioned up to now, uh, which has 111 liters. So it's a factor of 10 um, smaller in volume, um, but in active volume. However, the Reynolds number is the same because Novak 7000 7, has such a small effective viscosity. And here you see the experiment. We um, have fixed rotation rate of 20 hertz, and now we heat. We start to heat from 20 to 50, and you see that vapor bubbles form, um, and uh, they, they migrate down. They form first at the top because the pressure there is lowest. Here the pressure is higher. Uh, and um, when we show the temperature as a function of time, you see here, uh, after some time, the 42 degree is reached, and the stuff is boiling. Uh, and we will now measure the torque when, while going down from down here up to here. Um, and uh, those measurements is, are seen here. So first, we, when, when we heat a little bit, it reduces because the viscosity is temperature dependent. Um, but then once you have boiling at this point here, that means boiling, you get a dramatic uh, drag reduction here. Uh, and uh, drag reduction by vapor bubble now. So it's not by gas bubble, it's by, but it's by vapor bubble. And here we visualize this. Um, we uh, have a drag reduction here on this axis, uh, and um, the um, percentage of gas here, I mean, we, we measure this, how much boils. So when we have boiling, um, in fact, liquid is uh, coming out of the system, which we measure in the same way as we did before. And you see that right here, no drag reduction at all. But once it starts to boil, bubbles form, you get drag reduction up to 40%. And in fact, it is very, very similar to what you have for gas reduction. So here, we now plot the drag reduction on this axis versus the Taylor number, which changes because we change the temperature. Um, and um, the alpha, which is a consequence of the temperature change because of the boiling, uh, and you see when we now increase with time, here it starts to boil, uh, many bubbles form, here 8% bubbles, and those have the strong drag reduction. But while well, Taylor number, of course, it's changed. It's not kept constant mm -hmm. in, in these experiments. And when you now compare with the experiments which we did before, uh, it's in fact very, very similar. Here you see the drag reduction uh, for the gas bubbles, and this is the new experiment for the vapor bubbles, and we get the same amount of drag reduction for the same amount of either gas here or vapor. Also here in this plot, drag reduction versus gas concentration, it's very, very similar. So the system doesn't care too much whether it's a gas bubble or a vapor bubble, as the drag is produced correspondingly. Um, so um, the amount of vapor can be measured dynamically here. We get 
percent drag reduction in the presence of bubbles and the bubble deformability again is crucial so here we have uh, waiver numbers of four to uh, from between four and 13. Um, well in the final part of the talk so the last five minutes i will also explore uh, turbulent uh, emulsions uh, so up to now we had bubbles in turbulence but now we will go to oil droplets of emulsions and emulsions are of course very important i think i don't have to tell this to the audience of the international journal of multi-phase flow you will see various examples for emulsions uh, and when we mix water and oil uh, well oil is floating in water but when we shake uh, we get in, in fact an emulsion um, but this with time separates again into phases and after some time oil is floating again on the water um, uh, this happens if you don't stabilize this. In mayonnaise, you put in some uh, emulsifier to keep this emulsion constant, and this is what you see here. And this is where you can achieve 80% emulsion with 80% oil instability. But this is all chemistry. This is surfactants effect, so to say. And we don't want to use uh, such emulsifier. We want to make emulsion simply by uh, turbulence, very strong turbulence. Reynolds number is 2 times 10 to the 6. And we get this emulsification by a strong turbulent driving. In the beginning, we start off with water at the bottom and oil at the top, and then we drive. And the crucial control parameter is the ratio of oil as compared to the total volume. Alpha is uh, the, now the volume concentration of oil. And we take, in fact, a silicon oil, which is very similar viscosity as compared to water. So water is uh, one millimeter squared per second, and the silicon oil has 1.03 millimeter squared per second. So it's basically the same, and this is the silicon oil here. Um, so what happens? And this is what you see here. Down here, you have water. Up here, you have oil. And now we start to rotate. Uh, this movie goes four times faster than real time. And you see that at this interface here, you get a mixing, um, and you first get the water droplets entrapped in the oil here. You get oil droplets entrapped uh, in the water here. And this is, in fact, mixing uh, pretty well. And then uh, after a few seconds, uh, it's totally mixed. So um, you now uh, hardly see uh, the initial state any longer. And at some point, it will all be very milky and uh, uh, very white because of the relay scattering. So now basically, I think you cannot see any longer uh, in what state you started. And uh, it turns out that for this case, 10% uh, oil fraction in the beginning is all very stable. So um, it's stable for hours after this mixing procedure. So it looks completely white due to the relay sc uh, sc uh, scattering. This is at 10% oil percentage, percentage in the beginning. It's very different. When you go up to 70% of oil in the beginning, you also mix, but when you then turn off, it immediately demixes. You have phase uh, segregations within seconds. But we don't understand this, so um, why, why there is this huge difference. So while oil in water is stable, here is the case, uh, water in oil is not stable, and it immediately demixes. Um, so what about the drag on the inner cylinder? And we can measure it just in the way we, we did before. We measure the torque of the middle inner cylinder here. It's uh, distributed into three parts. And here we can measure the drag with very high precision. Uh, and this is what we get. This is the torque as function of alpha uh, divided by uh, the torque without uh, any oil. So alpha is zero. And you see we have increased torque here. Uh, this is all oil droplets in water, whereas here, uh, the torque, in fact, is smaller than at the beginning. So you have a sudden transition uh, from oil droplets in water to water droplets in oil, uh, which very different properties here. So here's the inversion point. Here's catastrophic phase inversion from water droplets in oil to oil droplets in water. And we would like to express this in terms of an effective viscosity. And therefore, we use our global scaling laws, which I explained in the beginning. So the Taylor number. Uh, Defined here, basically the square of the inner Reynolds number and the Nusselt number. And we know how it scales uh, for single phase flow. And what we assume is that also in this two phase flow, in this emulsion, the global response is assumed, assumed to be Newtonian. 
Uh, and well, here is a famous slope, Nusselt as function of Taylor, goes like 0.39 or 0.4 locally. This is for a pure liquid, and this holds for both water uh, or for oil. So zero, alpha is zero is pure water, alpha is 100 is pure oil, and it holds. Uh, and so the idea is now that let's take the data for alpha is 70% emulsion, and let's assume some effective viscosity for that case. This is what we want to determine, and we try different effective viscosities. And this is what we get for Nussel as function of, uh, of Taylor. But we know that it should be on this curve. So we have to fine tune this. And out of this fine tuning procedure, we in fact then get what is the correct effective viscosity. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, technically a little bit complicated. I won't go into this. So we have 32 experiments with different alpha, six of them. We know the viscosity exactly, namely those for pure water and for pure oil. And of 26, we don't know this, but there we fine tune the effective viscosity such that we get uh, data on this curve. And with this, uh, in fact, we get this curve totally uh, uh, collapsing, nuzzled as function uh, for Taylor for these various uh, concentrations. Uh, and uh, out of this, we can read off the effective viscosity. And the result is shown here, uh, the effective viscosity um, here we have the ambulance uh, region. Here we have this uh, uh, catastrophic phase transition. And note that the effect effective viscosity of the emulsion is smaller than uh, that of any ingredient, which is pretty remarkable. So, you know, uh, here we had a viscosity of one uh, millimeter squared per second for water. Here also basically one uh, for pure oil. Uh, but in between here in this regime, for water droplets in oil, the effective viscosity goes down. And here, uh, in fact, it's, it goes up and we have catastrophic phase inversion. Well, this is where we start uh, with, uh, in fact, a preset um, oil concentration alpha, but now we do alpha sweeps. We put in oil in the uh, top and get out oil at the, at the bottom or the mixture at the bottom, or we do this with water. And with this, we do sweeps. And what we get out of these sweeps is this. So first, we sweep alpha up by adding more and more oil. And we go up here, and here we get the catastrophic phase inversion at about 72%. But when we go back um, now, we're reducing alpha, uh, the transition only happens here at around 50%. So here you have history, this uh, behavior for this catastrophic phase inversion. Um, and um, we, we drain this out, and uh, when this happens, we have a very sudden transition of the flow. So really see this. So here we, we put in water at the top and drain out um, uh, the, the mixture, and you really see this very sudden transition here. It's an almost instantaneous change of the flow morph morphology from oil droplets in water to water droplets in oil. So uh, how does it look like? What's the close up? Um, well, for the case of oil droplets in water, it's easy because we can take it out. It's stable for a long time. But for the case of water droplets in oil, it is not stable. And there you, in fact, have to go to the setup. You have to have openings here, which we did with some lenses. And we brought, in fact, as a microscope towards this setup. And uh, here are the openings uh, which we used for the optics. And here you see the experiment, and Dennis Buckholz did this, and he loved to do this, these large-scale experiments. So here we have our huge device, 111 liters. Here's a high-speed camera hanging from a crane from the ceiling. And here we have a laser to allow for incoherent light to, uh, in fact, to avoid uh, any uh, optical effects. So here's a camera hanging from the ceiling, look, uh, looking into the flow. And with this, we got pictures of this type, um, oil droplets in water or water droplets into oil, uh, and uh, analyze the size. And what we see uh, is uh, here, the size as a function of alpha. And we see that at phase transition, um, we also get a considerable uh, increase of the size. So this is, in fact, uh, oil droplets in water, which are larger then here water droplets in oil and here is this transition so here we in fact we go down in this historic curve in alpha concentration so the conclusion on this is that emulsions with oil and water of similar viscosity behave a newtonian on this global scale 
the flow has hysteresis with a catastrophic phase inversion when changing the concentration of the alpha. Um, inside this ambivalence region, uh, the torque can vary a lot depending on whether you're on the upper branch or on the lower branch. And uh, we can, uh, so to say, use our Taylor-Coyette device as a rheometer uh, for this metastable uh, emulsion um, and can measure uh, this effective viscosity in this turbulent regime. Um, and, uh, well, this is in fact the newest work, it just came out uh, last year. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank my co-workers again. Um, and, uh, well, I think over the years, they did great work and it was a great pleasure to work with them. A great intellectual uh, pleasure. And I think we learned a lot on uh, turbulent bubbly flow and uh, also on emulsions. And I would like to end with these uh, four snapshots. So we did experiments for bubbly Taylor Paired flow uh, and for standard Taylor Paired flow without bubbles. We did numerics for bubbly Taylor Paired flow and also for standard uh, Taylor Paired flow. It's a wonderful device. It's a drosophila of physics of fluids from which you can learn a lot and control a lot. And with this, I would like to end uh, and I take questions. Uh, I stopped sharing now. So thanks a lot, Detlef. Thanks a lot for this very nice seminar. I really appreciate it, your journey to all your, the scales and the different physics that can be explored in the Taylor Quaid facility. Thanks a lot. Now it's time for questions. Um, and, uh, Alfredo, can I start? The, hello, Bala. Hi. Hello, Detlef. Hello, uh, Bala. Fascinating talk, uh, a real tour de force. Uh, um, you, you showed us all, all the range of uh, uh, fascinating phenomena with uh, multi-phase flow. I have uh, several questions, but I will start with one. Uh, um, very early in your talk, uh, uh, where you showed the videos of uh, uh, low drag reduction and large drag reduction, one thing that uh, was, uh, at least to me, was very striking, uh, um, since you had a lot to cover, you didn't emphasize that. The bubbles were forming some patterns. Uh, they, they, they were not really um, like um, spread uniformly. There were some uh, uh, underlying some, uh, what looked like Taylor uh, um, donut-like pattern, some some regions of clustering and regions of unclustering. Uh, was my uh, observation uh, uh, correct? Uh, and did that play a role? Because that seemed to also differentiate between low drag reduction and high drag reduction. Uh, yes, uh, you, yeah. uh, yes, I agree, this is the case. So um, in particular, uh, when you have uh, bubbles, uh, which are not so buoyant, these bubbles are simply uh, trapped in the Taylor vortices. So you see the structure of the Taylor vortices. I mean, it's, it's nearly unavoidable. I mean, even in the turbulent regime, you kind of see the structure of the Taylor vortices. So the, the bubbles like to go inside the vortices, um, in particular the small ones, and um, uh, therefore they, they signal where the Taylor vortices are. In fact, when you have tiny bubbles, you uh, can use them to, to measure the regions of low pressure. So indeed, uh, you discover um, with this technique uh, the, um, the vortices, because these bubbles, say small bubbles, simply go into the vortices. I mean, heavy stuff is thrown out of the vortices, small bubbles go in, and therefore you see this. At the, for Taylor Cat, of course, you see the Taylor vortices. This effect, uh, effect gets less when you get more turbulent because then the Taylor vortices are kind of washed out. And it also gets less when you have larger bubbles because the larger bubbles, they don't care so much about the flow. Um, they, they, they simply go up. But, but for in particular small bubbles and not so large Reynolds numbers, this is a very clear effect when you have the trapping of the bubbles. I mean, this is what I showed in this one plot in the numerics where the bubbles were in bands. And these are the bands of the, uh, in fact, the Taylor rolls. Thank you. I will let others ask questions and if there is time, I will come back. Thanks a lot, Bala. If there is uh, ready questions, otherwise I have one. 
So I have one question, Detlef. Uh, in the case of uh, low Reynolds number in, in your drag reduction experiments in the Taylor Quaid facility, you said that the drag reduction is due to the disruption of the Taylor of the Taylor rolls, right? And uh, uh, but I think that in this type of flow, you have three different types of flow. You have the average flow, you have the turbulent flow, which is generated at the wall, and then you have the Taylor rolls, which uh, are born of different uh, of different source. So maybe uh, the only portion of drag that it is reduced is not the drag which is generated by the turbulence, but the drag which is generated by the Taylor rolls. Yes. So. Yes. yes, so you, yes. you you might also, I mean, for, for this type of flows, I'm not sure if you if you tried that, that, there is a typical technique which is called the triple decomposition, which you could apply to understand the, the energy exchange between these three components of the flow. So I agree very much. So this is, uh, I mean, we didn't do experiments, this is a numerical simulation, so we did numerical experiments, so to say. So there uh, it is... Uh, in fact, exactly this effect, what you what you show, the bubbles, uh, they destroy uh, these uh, Taylor rolls and uh, they rise. And uh, in this sense, this is not total and drag reduction. So it is, uh, well, I mean, for those numerics, uh, which I showed you, it's not particular turbulence. I mean, Reynolds number is a few thousands. And um, uh, it's, it's uh, yes, it's this effect, as you say. Thanks, Detlet. And one can indeed quantify this. So one, one, one could, with increasing Reynolds number, in fact, try to disentangle this. So what is um, due to the buoyancy effect and this destruction of these uh, Taylor rolls by the bubbles and what is due to the Weber number? So one could try to disentangle this by the techniques which we suggest. Thanks. So, okay. Okay, I, I have Great. one question. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I, Detlin, how are you doing? So, so uh, obviously, it seems like many uh, characteristics from the Kuwait flow will carry over to other types of flow. But are there some parameter range where that, where the sort of the structure of the Kuwait flow is really dominating to the degree that it might not carry over to, say, channel flow or flow in boundary layers and things like that? Uh, well, I mean, this is in particular in in uh, for the for the uh, small Reynolds number. Um, I mean, there it's so, so strongly dominated by these Taylor rolls uh, that then uh, indeed um, it's uh, different uh, than in channel flow or in um, in pipe flow. I mean, in this regime for strong drag reduction uh, by uh, in, in strong turbulence, there our argument uh, for this uh, shipbuilding industry always is it's similar uh, because uh, for under the ship hull bubbles go up. Uh, because of buoyancy and sit uh, under the ship hull. And in our case, in fact, uh, uh, there's this, you have the centrifugal forces. So the heavy water is thrown out uh, and the bubble um, experience forces towards the inner cylinder. This is what you saw. I mean, that's why you saw this high local concentration up to 30% of bubbles close to the inner cylinder. And that's, so to say, the analog uh, to bubbly, bubbly drag reduction in this naval context, because they are, they are interested, of course, in rising bubbles. So it's always uh, it takes us quite some effort to to explain why it's relevant, uh, why this teller, what this Taylor Quet facility has to do with the ship hull. But it, it is in this regime uh, of uh, very strong turbulence um, where the analogy is best. And indeed, you are right that for a small degree of, of turbulence, uh, everything is Taylor -o. Um, uh, dominated and then um, well we would have a hard time uh, to uh, to argue that it has anything to do with the flow under the ship hull but fortunately the Reynolds number is comparable uh, so we uh, in fact for a ship hull the Reynolds number up to 10 to the 8 so it's what well, we, we even with our device we don't get that we have 10 to the 6 but uh, those experiments which I showed you the numerics I showed you there's 10 to the 3 so there is different but well some 10 to the 6 is similar to 10 to the 8 and there we can really argue uh, that uh, the uh, flow is uh, has similar features. Thanks. Can I ask one question? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you very much for the very impressive talk and for your referring our study. I have one question. If you put surfactant 
to the vapor bubbles, vapor bubbles. What do you expect? Do you, have you ever tried the to put the surfactant to the vapor bubble quit float? We Get didn't. Uh, we didn't. And the, the reason is that uh, there you have this it, um, effect, this um, uh, fluorocarbon uh, liquid. So it's very different liquid. So this, uh, we would need different surfactants. Um, so uh, your, your surfactants Triton X, which is exactly the same which you use. I mean, this works well for water, but it doesn't um, okay. Okay. work well for the fluorocarbons. And um, Okay. Uh, well, we, we wouldn't know, um, well, at least we didn't think about um, uh, surfactants for the fluor uh, carbons. And um, I, well, I mean, I think it's a chemical question. So what, what so that, the vaporization would be, would be good uh, for uh, liquids uh, of, of that type. So it is Novex 7000 and uh, well, it's organic uh, liquid. Okay. And uh, it's why well, I mean it would need very different surfactants. So I okay. we didn't we didn't look into this. I would expect because, the same. Yeah. I mean I would expect. Well, but yeah. vaporization will be also affected by the presence of the surfactant. Yes. So not because only would, the, what, the. What would be a possibility if if you uh, in fact inject many nuclei that you get um, uh, earlier nucleation. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, smaller vapor bubbles that then you would mm -hmm. have a similar mm -hmm. effect. So mm -hmm. if you throw that and burn, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so that, that, I mean, basically a nucleation studies, then you could mm -hmm. avoid to have big uh, vapor bubbles, but you would uh, have many small vapor bubbles because you offer the system um, nuclei in abundance. And then in fact, you may be able to achieve a similar effects, but we didn't How about, how, how about the suppletion of the clusters for the vapor bubbles? That is not clear, right? Pardon? If it is uh, the gas bubbles, yes. the surfactant will prevent the coalescence. But for vapor bubbles, yes. the phenomenon no, no, will be more complicated. I mean, yes. The surfactants we didn't yes. try, but we could get, in fact, uh, perhaps a similar effect by throwing in more nuclei. Then we would, would have, in fact, easier bubble nucleation. And therefore, That's you true. would have more bubbles, but smaller bubbles. And therefore, and, and we may get the... a similar effect. Okay. So, but we didn't try. I mean, but in other computation studies, people uh, did this. So they would throw in more uh, nuclei for bubble mm -hmm. nucleation, for vapor mm -hmm. bubble nucleation. Yes. And then they would see, um, in fact, more bubbles, okay. than smaller bubbles. So this may be a way to do it, but we didn't do this. I mean, this, these okay. experiments, they look uh, they look pretty easy, but they are not. So uh, Rodrigo, the yes, I understand. four years, I mean, one of the problem is that this Novak 700, I mean, the 7000 evaporates like mad. So, um, and it's expensive and also you don't want it in, fact, okay. in, in the lab in the air. So, so we had to build a device to recover uh, the evaporated Novak 7000 to put it back in the system. I mean, this was also one of the many challenges. So it's a highly difficult experiment. Okay, thank you very much for your comment. Hi, uh, I had a question uh, regarding the drag reduction. Is the deformability one of the crucial criteria or is there like a air layer effect uh, and or as the size of the bubble or the buoyancy dominates? Uh? Uh, no, but I mean, as I said, in the small Reynolds number um, regime, uh, it's a buoyancy effect. For the large Reynolds number regime, which is important for applications, uh, it is in fact the deformability. It is not uh, the local accumulation of bubbles uh, inside the um, in a cylinder. I mean, I had a plot where we in fact show that there's less local bubble accumulation at the inner cylinder, but uh, larger drag reduction, uh, the crucial issue really is the bubble deformability. Thanks. Alfredo, can I ask yep. one more? Of course. Um, that love, um, I remember several years ago, you gave a, a, a equally fantastic uh, talk at the APS, I believe, uh, um, where you sort of gave a very nice uh, mechanistic picture of uh, um, this transition in a single phase uh, uh, between uh, uh, the classical to ultimate or 
soft to hard turbulence. I mean, if you go back many, many, uh, like Leap Shabbers time, uh, you, you were part of that uh, original effort. So you, 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 you sort of gave uh, in terms of boundary layer scaling, et cetera. So I'm just going with my memory. Now, the question is, how does that single phase transition in the turbulence itself changes with the introduction of the bubbles in this case? So this transition between classical to, uh, um, to uh, ultimate uh, um, is modified by the presence of the bubble. And he also does the transition point itself, uh, the, uh, the uh, Taylor number or the Reynolds number, boundary layer Reynolds number where the transition happens. Uh, is it changing uh, from a single phase to a multi-phase? Yeah. That's an excellent question. And you remember correctly, so this was in fact in 2017 in Denver at the APS meeting when I talked about it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, well, there's single phase flow and there at uh, Taylor number uh, two times 10 to the eight, you have the transition uh, from classical turbulence to ultimate turbulence. This is the analog transition to what you have in Raleigh Benar uh, at mm -hmm. Raleigh number 10 to the 14, where you have mm -hmm. also the classical uh, uh, regime where Nussel is roughly like Raleigh to the one third uh, to um, Nussel going like Raleigh to the uh, 0.38. So here it's a one to one analogy to Taylor Cat. And this um, transition is, in fact, given by the boundary layer becoming turbulent, allowing for more transport and uh, then um, uh, having uh, this much stronger scaling. And to, from what we see is that this point doesn't change much um, with uh, uh, the addition of, of bubbles. So this is still around uh, 2 times 10 to the 8 here for this transition. I mean, it may change a little bit, but within the precisions to which we can find this transition from this classical turbulence to this ultimate turbulence, uh, it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't change much. I mean, here, in fact, for Taylor Cat, um, without bubbles, we can uh, have this transition even in the numerics. So for Raleigh Bernard, it's more difficult because the driving in Raleigh Bernard is not so efficient. But for Taylor Cat, we see the transition from classical turbulence to ultimate turbulence in our diagrammatical simulations. Um, and in fact, with the, with the bubbles, we can get uh, also in this regime. So, so um, I mean, it's, uh, uh, so we don't have any indication that this transition point uh, would change much by the bubbles. I mean, overall, you have 4% bubbles or so, and it doesn't change too much. Um, in the case I, of red blood, if you add particles, it could change your heat transfer in a very similar manner, right? For, I mean, um, for Raleigh Benar with particles added. Yes, I mean, yeah, multi -phase. with bubbles. I mean, there, there, in fact, there are two effects. Uh, we, we did this, in fact, also in the numerics. So in Raleigh Benar, when you add bubbles, um, there are two effects. I mean, first of all, the bubbles have buoyancy and they, they drive the flow. So you have extra driving by, by buoyancy. The second effect, which, uh, which can be the relevant one, depending on the parameters, is in fact where your bubble is a direct carrier. So the bubble nucleates at the bottom and has latent heat, and then it goes up and uh, condensates at the top, and then it, so to say, transports latent heat from the bottom to the top. And uh, what uh, is the dominant regime? Either the extra driving by uh, this extra buoyancy, which you add, or uh, is this direct transport of latent heat? This depends on the parameters. So that we studied with uh, Andrea Prosperetti, um, former uh, editor-in-chief uh, of uh, International Journal of um, uh, Multiphase Flow, so the pre predecessor of uh, Bala and Alfredo. So he, with whom we studied this, this very effect. So I have a question, Ditlif. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic question, the question on the catastrophic um, phase uh, um, separation or not separation in your, in your um, emulsion. So uh, Lele, you are using same viscosity fluids. Uh, so viscosity cannot be a parameter that drives uh, this, uh, this difference. And from, if I understand correctly, what happens is that you induce turbulence, the turbulence uh, mixes and breaks uh, the fluids. So, so you will have an emulsion uh, with small drops. Now, uh, 
once uh, uh, the emulsion is formed, the turbulence exists at some level. It's probably a different type of turbulence, but there will be turbulence. Uh, and this turbulence definitely can exist in the continuous phase, but maybe it exists also inside the small bubbles, so although this can, can be hardly uh, can be hardly measured. So it would be interesting perhaps also to try experiments with different viscosity with which uh, you can uh, uh, artificially alter the turbulence inside or outside the, uh, the drops. Uh, so changing the local Reynolds number because that can actually give you two important information, one regarding the, the turbulence inside or outside the drops and then also regarding the size of the drops. Well, so here uh, in the beginning, when we start to drive this, we indeed get turbulence in both phases, in the water phase and the oil phase. But I mean, once the droplets are smashed into pieces, I mean, they are so small that I think there is not much uh, flow inside these individual droplets. I mean, there is some movement, but I think uh, calling it not turbulence, true. I think it would be, would be too much. I mean, what plays a role are surfactants. I mean, these surfactants, they are a nightmare. And they cannot be avoided. And uh, we did um, experiments with Chao, uh, Chao Sun, uh, your associate editor from International Journal of Multiphase Flow. In his lab, um, they did experiments uh, with uh, smaller Reynolds number, so uh, uh, a, a smaller device, but with different uh, surfactants, and it really matters. So uh, the surfactants uh, seem to play uh, quite some role on whether these uh, droplets either coalesce or they, they don't coalesce. But to, to expect turbulence within one droplet, I mean, this is uh, the droplets are too small. I mean, they, they are. Uh, I mean, they, they deform, but they are basically advected and there's not much internal life in these droplets. Okay, thanks. So, I think we gave you uh, a lot of questions and I think uh, it's, it's the time is due uh, to wrap up for the conclusions. If there are other questions, we can accept maybe one. If there is no question, then I would like to thank you again, Detlef. Really, thank you very much for, well, for giving this seminar. Thanks for the opportunity. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, well, thanks for the very, very nice questions from a broad audience. So um, it's very good. And it's good to see uh, many friends and colleagues again, and hopefully <laughs> soon in person again. Hopefully, yes. Back, and... let's see. Yeah. Thank you again, Detlef, for the entire audience. Thanks a lot for joining uh, from all these different time zones. And don't forget uh, the next uh, seminar in two weeks from now. Have a good day. Bye, bye, bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You, thank you for the thank time. You. <laughs> bye. Thank you.